Good morning, church family. Hope you're safe and warm this Sunday morning. I, I can speak on behalf of all the pastors and all those who help lead in worship that we're sad we can't gather this morning, but we all don't have ice skates to get from our parking lot into the church building. So we thought it was best to worship safely and in a different way this morning, kind of shades of 2020 if we put that behind us. And hopefully we don't have to do this anymore this year. Uh, looking at the forecast, we should be able to resume uh, normal church operations early this week. Full disclosure, I'm recording this on Saturday, so I don't know what the weather looks like on Sunday today. Uh, but we'll know more uh, as day goes by, uh, we're taking one day at a time, and always check the church website for the most up-to-date information. We do have the Canadian Brass concert uh, coming up on Tuesday evening, and then also our Spaghetti Supper got moved from this past Thursday to this upcoming Thursday. If you want to make a reservation for the Spaghetti Supper, and if you didn't last week, uh, and make it in time for that, you can email kitchen at telecochurch.org. Well, I've lived here for most all my life, and this is the biggest weather event that I can recall. Some of you uh, who have been here for a while might remember the blizzard of 93, and I was a little too young to remember back then. I think I might have been in diapers still. But uh, talking with someone in a meeting this week about the weather, I asked them as a northerner, hey, when's all this stuff going to melt away? Thinking about when can we get back in the church and when will it be safe? And as a true northerner, he said early March or late March. Uh, And for some of you up north, this weather isn't anything. You get snow on the ground, and it's just a normal Sunday, normal Tuesday, like it's nothing else. But for us Southerner, for us Southerners, this is an apocalypse. Uh, someone here born and raised in the South, I've accepted my heritage that I don't know how to drive in this weather, and I don't know what to do. Now, there are many things that the South does do well. I mean, the food here is excellent. It'll shave a few years off of your life, though. And aside from a fluke year here or there, SEC dominates the college football landscape. And of course, the South is home to the mecca of country music. Now, while country isn't my go-to genre, I I do appreciate the vivid elements of storytelling in most songs. Uh, The tunes are good and catchy, of course. But the best artists and the best writers know how to tell a story. I mean, if you think of a few, A Boy Named Sue by Johnny Cash tells an incredible story. Whiskey Lullaby by Brad Paisley and Alison Krauss. Dolly's Coat of Many Colors. All of these tell incredible stories as you go through and stick with you. One song that I do love and that tells another incredible story is Tim McGraw's Live Like You Were Dying. If you're not familiar, uh, I can't play it here because it might get taken down, but if you're not familiar, it's a song about a man who gets an unfortunate diagnosis early in his life, and he has to come to terms and he's faced with the reality that he does not have as much life left to live as he thought he did. Tim McGraw then in the song asks him what he did after getting that news, and this chorus belts out saying he went skydiving, he went rocky mountain climbing, he went 2.7 2.7 seconds riding a bull named Fu Manchu. And then he spoke at the end of the chorus ending with, uh, or he, then he says he loved deeper. He spoke sweeter. And then finally wrapping up the chorus, he says, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. I, I think what resonates with most people about that song is that we know our time in this life is finite. But for most of us, that reality does not impact our daily lives. We aren't waking up on a Monday and saying, hey, I really want to go ride that bull named Fu Manchu. Or, hey, I need to go skydiving before the end of this week. See, if you know a snowstorm is coming this weekend, uh, you're going to stock up with what you need. You're going to get the firewood, the groceries. You're going to gas up the car. You're going to get everything you need and drip the faucets. But if you, know a so, if you know a storm is coming this year, you'd probably be prepared for a few weeks. But after those few weeks, after a few months, slowly is going to move to the back of your mind. It's become less and less important as other things rise up in your life. And the truth is, how we live reflects what we believe to be of the most importance. Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 29. He says, 
What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that this time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if they were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed by them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Paul here says our time is short. And there's a twofold meaning to what he's saying. First, he means quite simply our time on the earth is short. When you look at existence of the earth, of the universe and totality, and compare that to our 70 to 90 years of life, whatever we're blessed with, it's but a blip. And when you compare our lifespan to the infinite, to the eternal God, we're a puff of smoke, here and gone. But it's difficult for us to comprehend that because our life is real. It is now. It is meaningful. We're in the day-to-day of it. It's why Paul reminds them and reminds us, lest we forget that our time on this globe is temporary and that there is a new kingdom coming. I, I don't have time now to dive into the eschatology of all that, but what we see in scriptures is that since uh, the beginning of creation and ushered in through the cross, God has been working to redeem his creation and that one day he will return to claim what is rightfully his. And he will come for those who follow him and take them into the eternal paradise, into the redeemed heaven and earth. That's why Jesus told so many parables about being alert, being ready, mindful of how you're stewarding your life in God's creation. As a people who await his return, our lives should reflect that. Paul calls the people of Corinth and us to live in a resurrection anticipation not focused on the cares of the world, but by what he says. But what he says is a little strange here. He says, live as if not married. Live as if you're not mourning, as if you're not happy. Uh, Those who use the things of the world to not be engrossed by them, which can sound a little odd. And I like this explanation from the Pillar New Testament commentary. It says, the point here." is that Paul wants the Corinthians to learn how to sit loose to all earthly ties. He is not advocating withdrawal from or renunciation of the world and marital obligations, but a a relativizing of the importance of the things of the world. Paul counsels a clear-sighted measure of detachment based on the conviction that the cross has judged the present age and the goal of history looms. Such eschatological realities change forever the values to be put on current circumstances and happiness. I'll read that last one again. Such eschatological realities change forever the value to be put on current circumstances and happiness. Simply put, he's not advocating that we abandon all our responsibility. We don't leave our husbands. We don't leave our wives. We don't walk through life with some stoic uh, life that says nothing bothers us. We don't live completely detached from the world. Instead, we, we don't find our identity in this world. And we shouldn't be ruled by it or the things in it. And we shouldn't, li- and that we instead should live in the light of the coming reality. It's not a disengagement from this world, but an engagement to another, an engagement to an eternal kingdom. And what we see in life is that what we value dictates how we live. What a waste it would be for us to make it to the end of our life full of worldly accolades, full of accomplishments with a great investment portfolio that we can leave down to our kids, but then stand before the king spiritually bankrupt. The problem in our life isn't having enough time. The problem is how are we using our time? The Roman philosopher Seneca, and uh, newsflash, he lived a long time ago. He wrote this. He said, it's not that we have a short time to live, but that we waste a lot of it. Life is long enough, and a sufficiently generous amount has been given to us for the highest achievements, if it were well invested. 
But when it is wasted in heedless luxury and spent on no good activity, we are forced at last by death's final constraint to realize that it has passed away before we knew it was passing. As we close, I want to do so in a way that allows you to sit, allows you to pray, allows you to kind of sit with the Lord and and wrestle with some of these truths in our lives. And so thinking about your priorities, take a moment and uh, go ahead and pause me and get a pen and paper and write this down if you need to. Take a moment to assess your current priorities in life, your current priorities in life. Are there aspects of your life where you might be spending too much time on things of lesser importance? Are there areas where you recognized wastefulness or or heedless luxury? Perhaps they're distracting you from investing yourself in matters of God's kingdom. Perhaps they're keeping you from uh, spending time with him. How can you make intentional choices to invest your time and resources in activities and places that align with eternal values and eternal purposes. And then thinking about your identity. In what areas do you find your identity tied to worldly achievements or possessions, or even in relationships? Take time and read Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. It begins, this is also Paul, saying, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Pray for God to attune your heart to who he says you are, not what you've done. I'll leave you this morning with this quote from St. Augustine, who said, we cannot love what is eternal unless we cease to love what is eternal temporal. Learn to dismiss it before you are dismissed by it. Church, stay warm, stay safe, and live for eternity.